Um, I'd like to see a show of hands. How many students in the room? Give an idea. Good. Yeah, well, Quite a few students. Right. So, uh, actually, my week uh, has been spending about 30 years, my last 30 years of my life in healthcare, and it's been an interesting week. A lot of different experiences. I, uh, I let's say, flew out on Monday morning out of New York, New Jersey. Our offices are in New Jersey, and uh, flew out and uh, went to the West Coast. We have some of our leading scientists in San Juan Capistrano in Southern California, not a bad location. And, uh, and then from there, went up to one of our largest facilities for uh, Diagnostic Information Services in Los Angeles. And then went from there to uh, San Francisco, where the large healthcare conference is happening. Uh, JP Morgan every year sponsors one of the world's mm -hmm. largest healthcare conferences. And so we present to the financial market, and there's a lot of interest in what's happening in healthcare. And at that conference, you'd have all the sell side analysts, and they'd also have all our investors. So it's an interesting time. And then came back into Naples, Florida, and I'm on the board of uh, Covidian, a large device company. So interesting discussions around devices. And I came over here last night, and I was greeted last night by my wife, who spent the last 10 days in Haiti. She's actually a critical care nurse and has been working for about seven years in the north of Haiti in a hospital. So uh, I've had my full spectrum of healthcare, full spectrum of healthcare, and healthcare is a fabulous field. So uh, thank you again, University of Miami. So let me talk a little bit about the topic, and that's how all of this, spending the cost curve, has to do with providers and how it's affecting all of us. And I say all of us, because in my field, in our work at Quest Diagnostics, we are a provider. We actually uh, believe that it's not just about laboratory science. We actually are in the business of empowering better health with diagnostic insight. And we'll talk about that because this is a changing world. And in that regard, we actually touch about 150 million Americans every year with what we do. That's about a half a billion tests. We, um, we have an impact of about 30% of uh, adult Americans every year, a, a very substantial number. And, and over the course of two years, about 50% about of adult Americans are touched by Quest Diagnostics. So, we're right in the middle of it, and if you uh, study healthcare cost, if you just make simple math, uh, it's about 2.5 trillion. What we do in laboratories is about seven, it's about 3% of healthcare cost, but we believe, and some of the data will support this, about 70% of healthcare decision making is based upon what we do in the lab. Uh, that laboratory information is quite important. So we're right in the center of, uh, of really how we provide integrated delivery in working with the delivery of healthcare. So with this discussion, which I'm looking forward to, uh, the, the world of providers is changing. And as providers, we're all looking at what we do differently going forward. And so as providers, and I can speak on the behalf of Quest, we're right in the middle of all this. Uh, we're working on cost reduction strategies. We're working on redesign of our processes. We're working on integration strategies with integrated delivery systems. We're trying to understand how we can affect quality and cost and have better accountability. We're understanding what the difference will be, and that's why we have changed our organization from thinking about volume and cost and providing more testing to the power and the value of diagnostic insight in the delivery of care, and that's quite a change. So, with that, I'd like to introduce our two panelists that are seated up here with me. Uh, to the farthest, furthest right, furthest right in the panel, your left, is Michael Freed. Michael is the Executive Vice President for Spectrum Health. He's also the CEO for Priority Health. So, welcome, Mike. Thank you. Uh, to my right is Lynn Brighton. Lynn is the CEO for Mercy Health. And rather, me, rather than me telling them you about their background, I'd like to have each of them tell a little bit about their background and also talk about their healthcare systems. So, Mike, why don't we start with you? Sure, thank you. And uh, thank you for having me here today. Sorry, I'm, I'm from Michigan. Uh, I've been uh, at Spectrum Health and apologize for bringing the polar vortex down here on you all, but, <laughs> but not too sorry. Uh, but I would just uh, like to say a couple things. First of all, uh, my organization, uh, who are we and uh, what, what's my role in the organization? About a $4 billion healthcare system, half delivery system, half insurance. 
So pretty equally balanced. My background is in, really entirely in healthcare finance. It's what I've done my whole, uh, my, really my whole adult life. I've been a, I was a CFO before the Challenger explosion, so I did, started that at a very young age and have kind of been around this, this issue of healthcare costs my whole career. I would say uh, on, a, on a personal level, I've probably never been more optimistic about what's about to happen than I am right now. Some people, some of the panelists alluded to that earlier, and I'll leave that to Q&A as to why I kind of feel that way, that given the changes that are going on. I say that because I saw that there were a lot of students over here, and I would say I think you're walking into one of the most exciting uh, times in our history, and I guess one of the things I'd say with regard to that is I wish I wasn't 56 years old, <laughs> and I feel a real sense of urgency to accomplish a lot here in a very short period of time because I know that you know my days in this in these kind of roles are beginning to wane, and others will take over. So I think there's a great sense of urgency for a lot of us who have been at this a long time to to really do a lot of uh, very good things in a short period of time. I think that that's great. Spectrum Health, just to uh, close on this. What we basically do to set the stage for the comments that I'm going to say, and I hope uh, I don't offend anybody with them, but what I'm going to try to do is take this down to probably a more microeconomic level in terms of what we go through, because I'm the epitome of cognitive dissonance. I live every day between insurance and delivery system, and we fight constantly, uh, constructively. And I think what, as we go uh, forward today, and as we go forward through some of these discussions, what I'll try to do is point out what we are seeing what the actual data that we see that's driving our behavior. Because what we want to do in our organization is really very simple. We want to take care of our community. First and foremost, that's what we want to do. We're just a, a very typical Midwestern uh, community in that regard. And what we want to do is pretty much this. We want the best outcomes, the best quality for all of our uh, people who live there. And we want the lowest per capita cost. We want that by 2020. That's what we're trying to do right now. So we want to be the leader for health by 2020 as we've defined it on that value equation. And that's what we work at very, very diligently. So I'll close with that, and I'll leave the rest of the comments to Q&A. And I look forward to the session with you all. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Lynn? Yeah, sure. So I want to just echo what Mike said. I, I absolutely enjoy what I'm doing in healthcare right now. I've been in healthcare for 20 years plus, and it is the most fascinating time I've ever experienced. Uh, it's challenging, and it's full of change, and if you like being creative and inventing and innovating, then it's the place to be. If, on the other hand, you want an industry or an organization that's sort of in a maintenance mode, it's sure not the place to be, because nothing that we did in the past is going to work in the future. I've been CEO at Mercy since 2009. I actually started at Mercy in 1992. Uh, in the Oklahoma City operation of Mercy, and I worked my way up through the organization. Different roles, marketing, uh, IT, uh, responsible for different markets, supply chain, so just a whole collection of different things, and then was fortunate in 2009 to be handed uh, the role of CEO, handed up this ministry to me. Prior to that, I was in the retail industry, a regional executive, so you can imagine what that leap was in 92 from retail to healthcare. Fortunately, I had a mentor who was willing to put up with a million why do you do it that way kind of questions, and uh, he didn't kick me out, and he was kind of a legend in mercy at the time, so I was a little worried that maybe I'd bitten off more than I could chew, but I guess it's worked out since I've had the privilege to be CEO. Let me tell you a little bit about Mercy, just to put it into context for you. Mercy, um, the Mercy that I lead came into existence in 1856. It's a not-for-profit Catholic healthcare ministry. It's spread across four states. It's Missouri, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Kansas, and 32 hospitals, 300 ambulatory locations, and they're all arranged in a hub-and-spoke kind of structure. There's no question Mercy was born a hospital company. So when the sisters started everything it, back in their day in 1850, it's all about building hospitals in community. But we've evolved a lot beyond that. Probably the best way that I can illustrate that for you is to say this. Last year, 2013, we cared for 3.1 million unique individuals across those four states. 180,000 spent the night in one of our hospitals. And all of the rest, 2.9 million, were cared for in one of those ambulatory locations. So we've evolved way beyond being a hospital company. We have a comprehensive electronic medical record. All locations in all four states are on one platform and one record. So it does not matter where you come to visit Mercy, at your doctor's office or at your hospital, your record is there. You don't have to bring it all with you. And um, we also believe that record is yours as the patient. Uh, it's not just ours to use in your care. So we make it accessible over the web 
to all of those patients. And to date, we have 400,000 uh, customers, patients, who access their electronic medical record online. They email their doctor, they schedule their appointments, they get their lab results, and they do e-visits, which I've really been fascinated to watch how that's taken off. And if you keep up with the weather, you know, St. Louis was in that vortex that Michael mentioned, and there was a pretty uh, disabled city. It couldn't get around. And during the two weeks that we dealt with all that, e-visits quadrupled because people couldn't get out. They sat on their sofa and visited their doctor instead. So I'm proud of our physicians for being willing to adapt like that. Uh, we have about 300,000 lives that we care for at risk out of that 3 million, so various levels of risk that you can imagine. About 120,000 of those are direct employer arrangements where we do the benefit design, we administer, we do the care management, and a third-party administrator keeps track of the claims and that sort of thing. We also are very big believers in virtual care. We often say that healthcare today is simultaneously local, regional, and virtual. So you can imagine out of those 32 hospitals, we have some in rural communities. They need access to care. And in our bigger urban places, we have those specialties. So we bring that capability to those smaller communities through telemedicine. Uh, we have an electronic ICU, 450 beds monitored from a command center in St. Louis. And I could tell you all about that, but this is probably the most important thing to this conference about bending the cost curve. The mortality rate in those ICUs, because of that centralized monitoring and the teamwork that that, uh, and the expertise that that avails on every institution, is 20% below the expected mortality rate for those ICUs. So I'll let you do the math on those hundreds of thousands of patients every year, how many of them got to go home that otherwise wouldn't have. The length of stay is down 30% too, because that expertise is brought to bear. So the economic burden in all those communities of healthcare is diminished because we get the patient home sooner. A couple of other things, we take care of 40,000 congestive heart failure patients and we monitor them all from a resource center, some even in their home with monitoring devices. And we have a telestroke program that's pervasive throughout our organization and it's fascinating to me as we rolled it out, the state of Arkansas, for example, has one of the highest mortality rates from stroke. And in the Arkansas facilities as we implemented it, in most cases in the first 60 days we had it in place, the number of TPA administrations was equal to the entire year before. So lots of lives impacted, lots of recoveries enabled. There's actually 72 telemedicine capabilities or programs that we have across Mercy. And uh, we'll break ground in March of this year on the nation's first virtual care center where we're going to bring all that together. And I'll stop there. That just gives you a flavor of the type of organization that Mercy is. And we'll talk more as the questions unfold about some of the things we're trying to accomplish. Thank you. Well, thanks, Lynn, and thanks, Mike. So you can see we have a lot to talk about, and innovation is a part of this as well. And you know, a lot of the innovation is around delivery, but as Lynn just said, some of the innovation is actually coming from technology. And I'm happy to hear about your example at EICU. Uh, you probably see, I'll tell my background, I actually managed Philips Healthcare before, and I'm proud to say that I'm familiar with that system because uh, it was an acquisition I actually did. It was a spinoff of Johns Hopkins, and it's a really great example where innovation uh, can really help change. Uh, critical care, mm. a substantial uh, change in that environment. So let's start with uh, the category of cost. You know, it's a tough one. You know, you're bending the cost curve. You, know, you could avoid it, but you need to talk about it. Some people talk about a lot of waste in healthcare, and you know, the only way you get waste out is to be able to change. And we're all working on change. And let me start by talking about what we're doing at Quest. The Quest, we actually, you know, as part of our strategy, we have a strategy around driving operational excellence. And, you know, the operational excellence is really, really uh, engaged around the whole notion that we can get better. You know, we can get better at how, what we do every day, and we have work that we want to really provide a superior patient experience and, and customer experience. At the same time, we have to get efficiency, uh, efficient and more efficient every day. So we're working on efficiency. And I, earlier today, they talked about process reengineering and process redesign and taking cost out and taking out inefficiency. So we're working at that at Quest. And we're not alone. And many healthcare systems are looking at how they change how they deliver healthcare. And it's not just about cost, but it's also about the quality of healthcare. At the same time, you can reduce cost. And we've been doing some benchmarking. Uh, there's some great examples. Uh, Virginia Mason and the Seattle area has done some work up with the Toyota concept. Uh, the Cleveland Clinic has taken a hard look at what they're doing around the patient experience. UCLA has done a lot of work. I and mean, actually, we've done some modeling 
of what excellent retail brands have done around the whole experience at the same time to become more efficient. So let me throw it back to Mike. And Mike, could you give us a couple, three examples of what you're doing to reduce cost and get better at what you do? Sure. Uh, first of all, let me start out with well, uh, where do you focus? You know, you typically, you get this question, everybody shuts down because you're get, if you have 100 people in the room, you're going to get 100 opinions. So what are we doing in my organization at Spectrum Health, and what particularly am I doing inside my health plan? In all the years that I've been in healthcare finance, and again, I'm not an economist, but in all the years that I've been in healthcare finance, I've really only found two things that have a material impact, and I'll use the word material in the context of EY, I know they're in the room, but you know, material in terms of the material, materially impact, which has a 0.98 correlation in the United States. If you look at Japan, it's 0.98. If Mexico, it's 0.95. The more money we have, the more we're going to want to spend on our health care. The less money we have, the less money we're going to spend on our health care. That's point number one. The second one has been chronic disease, and we haven't talked a lot about chronic disease, although it was alluded to by a couple of, the, I think, the previous panelists. This is a huge issue today. Uh, in my health plan, and I bet Florida Blue is the same and just about everybody else, 50% of the membership drives 92% of the health care spend. The other 50% drive eight in my health plan. So again, you can compare numbers and look and see whether South Florida <coughs> is the same. Now, the question then is, what do you do about these two things? And I guess I would argue what we're seeing happening is, and what, why I said I was optimistic and very interested in what's been changing, is because a couple of things have been happening. Why are we sitting here today with lower health care inflation in the last few years than we had certainly in my career prior to this. Yet, let's face it, we're all kind of down on this whole subject, but, but something is changing. Something fundamentally is changing. In my market, a couple of things really, really changed. Number one, a lot of our employers uh, did just what Helen Darling was saying. We had an awful lot of people switch over and say, I'm going to put deductibles and co-pays in place. They impacted people's income. Remember the correlation that I said between income and health care costs. I've been seeing this year after year after year, this, this kind of moderation happening. Now again, it's not causal, it's correlated. So I can't tell you that that's necessarily uh, the driver of that, but it's something we're watching very carefully. And so what we're doing is we're investing in transparency. So I've done a lot of that over the last 10 years of my career. Most recently in our health plan, what we did is we went out and put the cost of procedures online. If you're a Priority Health member, you can go out to our website and you can look up what it's going to cost you and by June, what you'll also be able to do is be able to see exactly at that moment when you're getting the care, uh, how much it's going to cost you at that moment and how much it's going to cost you out of pocket. So we put those things uh, in place already. Obviously, the reason is we needed to meet people where they are, that with more responsibility, we've got to give them the tools necessary to behave uh, appropriately. Interestingly, it's been the employers that have wanted that more than the individuals. We've gotten tremendous pressure from the employers and, and are, are very happy that we're doing it. Second issue that I mentioned, the chronic disease costs in particular. This is a really vexing problem. I wish I had understood this better with my physician colleagues. I wish I had asked more questions years ago. It took me too long to understand this. But right now, what I have in my organization is people with a 90% probability of admission in the next 12 months, 20% of them haven't seen their primary care physician in the prior 12 months. We don't really have a system to manage chronic disease. And I live in a place where the Medicare per capita costs run about $8,500 a year, okay? We're not real expensive. But we did our own home-based primary care approach where we said, you know what, let's take a bunch of these chronic disease patients and let's manage them differently. Not changing the future of chronic disease, changing the model that we have right now for the existing chronic disease patients that we have. And what we have found, actuarially adjusted, so my actuary sits down, takes out the mortality, et cetera, about a further 20% reduction in healthcare spend on them. So what's the big struggle for us? That's 50% driving 92% of the healthcare spend. The problem is I can't scale the approach that I have for that 50%. And that's the big challenge for us as we're redesigning a care model, which is what we're trying to do. How do I use technology? How do I use mobile applications? For a lot of you young people coming out, these are great opportunities from a career development standpoint because we're going to need to put some of these tools <coughs> with patients in order to manage these things so that they self-report data, so that the health navigators don't have to go out there and kind of call every one of these people with chronic disease every day to kind of see how they are, but rather can flag when there's a problem 
like if my mother's diabetes acts up all of a sudden and you don't find out until she shows up at the ED. We need to know those things ahead of time. So a lot of emphasis on transparency because of where we're seeing this impact and correlation with personal income and healthcare expenditures. A lot of emphasis on chronic disease because frankly, that's where the money is. The last piece of it within my hospital system is we've done lean manufacturing kind of throughout to try to just uh, in effect survive this potential reduction in revenue. And so what we're doing there is just kind of systematically going through and applying lean to some of our major areas in particular. Thanks, Mike. Well, let me right. just touch on one part because you talk about transparency. And, and transparency um, is a powerful, powerful change in healthcare. And you talk, you're speaking to the change of that. And, and part of the change is uh, the statistic I have seen about 30% of uh, employer-based healthcare systems now are high deductible. So more and more impact of decisions that are made every day are in, you know, the, in the interest of the patient or the consumer. Could you talk a little bit about how you're seeing the consumer make choices based upon the data they're looking at between a hospital or a physician or even a lab? Yeah. Sure, uh, I'm really frustrated, quite honestly. So far, you know, we've put a lot of investment in this. And what we're, we're dealing with, I think, the same problem that all of us are dealing with in our day-to-day -day lives. We're kind of telling people, okay, here's the tool. And they're kind of saying, well, I don't want the tool. You're, my employer wants me to have the tool, but I'm not crazy about this whole idea. So because of, as se several people were saying, people have higher deductibles, they don't want those higher deductibles. But we're saying, well, I'm giving you the tool to be able to shop. And the first thing that I'm seeing so far is you have those engaged users who will use it. Mm -hmm. And you have others who are saying, I really, really don't like this very much. And I would really like this all to go away. And I think that's what I think many of us deal with on a, on a, on a day to day basis. If you talk to my call center, these mm -hmm. are the kind of things that uh, they hear. One of the things that they do say, though, is uh, I only have probably 60% of my network of providers agreeing to be transparent and report their information. And so I specifically have to call them out and say this provider will not report, you know, mm -hmm. provide that information. I don't see how we as an industry, and again, I've been on all sides of this argument my whole career, I don't see how we can go forward and say with any credibility that we want to change and then we're not willing to be transparent and have a discussion about what actually is, you know, it costs to have a procedure done. I think that has to change and has to change immediately. That's great, Mike. Mm -hmm. Lynn. A couple, three examples of yeah, what you've done absolutely. to affect the cost curve. So if we're going to make this successful, we have to do the whole process of utilization management. We have to do get rid of the waste. We have to do a better job taking care of patients. We have to get them healthy, keep them out of the hospital, keep them out of the doctor's office, and that means less revenue. If we're going to thrive in that environment, then we have to also reduce the cost structure that has driven healthcare providers for a long time. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of what we're doing because it's a multifaceted thing. There is no single thing you can do that will make all of this work. It's a multitude of things, and you have to do them in some level of concert. Um, but I want to make a point, that, and Helen made it earlier. She talked about business process engineering. She said, you know, medical school, talk to the engineering school. Well, guess what? The chief executive leading our performance acceleration process for clinical is a cardiologist with an engineering degree. It's fascinating, isn't it? And he absolutely loves what he's doing, and he is incredibly credible with his peers. And here's what he's doing on that front. Mercy has implemented 32 automated care paths. So I, and when I say automated, I really mean automated. So with his colleagues in different disciplines, different specialties, they've implemented automated care paths. Once the diagnosis is entered in the system, all orders are initiated. And we've taken out all that waiting and white space for patients. So we've compressed the time it takes to get the care. And we've eliminated all those wasteful, unnecessary tests as well. In all 32 care paths, we've lowered the length of stay, we've reduced the cost of care, and the quality <laughs> outcomes are better as a result of that. And the physician adoption is pretty good. On the orthopedic care path, we've got 100% adoption across Mercy. Others, it's only 30 or 40. But Seth's job is to get all of those care paths at 100% adoption. So that's an example of clinical process redesigned based on evidence that's physician-led, but with a lot of science around it. His counterpart on the business side is also an engineer who also has, happens to be an operational leader. And his assignment four years ago was to take $250 million out of the cost structure, the operating cost structure of the organization, and mainly 
out of the back office, if you want to think about it that way. A lot of times when healthcare providers consolidate and merge and integrate, they fail to reap the benefits of all of that and take the synergies out. We've worked really hard to do it. Every single back office function is centralized, standardized, and consolidated, highly automated today. And as a result of that, we have lowered the headcount in all those functions, and we've grown at the same time. So often we've got the same number of people processing twice as much work because of the growth of the organization. So that taking that out of the infrastructure, that 250 million, but you've got to make some investments to do it. You can't just use the old methods. You've got to have new tools, new ways of automating, and you've got to get people who are willing to say, I'm going to reinvent how I do my work. And sometimes my finding is, at least, is you can't get the people currently doing that work to really imagine how to do it differently, and you have to infuse some new talent and some new help with them. Now, we're not done. We're not satisfied with that. In fact, as we look across our ministry today, we actually had Milliman do a study, and we said, what if we took all the learnings we have about how to manage chronic disease and how to keep patients healthy and out of the hospital, out of the doc all that, and just implemented it 100% everywhere all at one time? What would that do to Mercy? Mercy is a $4.6 billion company. It would take $500 million out of our revenue stream. Why? I can't do that. It would bankrupt Mercy. I, you know, 1850 was would not on my watch do I want it to be when that happens. So we've got to do it in a, in a thoughtful, progressive kind of way. And what we've concluded is that we have to go add another $400 million in cost. And it's got to come out of the clinical side of the house as well as the operational side of the house. And here's how we're going to approach it. We call it Project Noah's Ark. My COO has a penchant for biblical names. I don't know why he picked that one. But anyway. We're going to pilot it in a single community, but we're going to design it mercy-wide. And that's how we did the electronic medical record. Everybody came together, designed it, we implemented it in one place, and then we propagated it everywhere in about three years. Noah's Ark's going to be the same way. We're going to go into the acute care setting, and we're going to reimagine how everything gets done using new technologies and lean design. And we're going to invite the community to participate with us, because the last thing we want is to design a, an acute care hospital experience that nobody wants, that's not customer friendly, or isn't focused on meeting their needs and wants. So we're gonna get them to be sort of the judge and jury over whether the redesigned process works or not. And one example, it's a simple one, but it's, it's an example of technology. You read about all these new biometric monitoring devices, and they're even coming out. Have you, did you see the note the other day? I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, these little onesies for babies with all these monitors in them now, and you put the onesie on the baby, and it tells you respiration and temperature and all that stuff. Think about that. Same thing in the hospital, a little device about this size on the chest of a patient, monitors respiration, blood pressure, whether they're laying, standing, whatever. We've been testing those. Think about if the nurse didn't have to take vital signs every six hours. The system just captured it on a continuous basis. And that's just one example of how technology can simplify work, allow that nurse to practice at a higher level of knowledge and expertise, and take some pretty rudimentary work off the plate. That's one of the ways that Noah's Ark is going to have an impact. So those are just a few examples. Yeah, Lynn, that's great. Uh, there's so much going on throughout yeah. all of health care. And you touched a little bit on you know, the changing na nature of health, how health care really works. You know, it's a system that's moving away from we get paid for everything we do, so it's a volume-based system, mm -hmm. to one that healthcare systems are really gonna to start to compete based upon the value. Mm -hmm. And you'll get it back to transparency, really compete based upon the value proposition you have in that marketplace. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit about how you're looking at that transition of moving to a value-based competitive world and I guess the mm -hmm. St. Louis marketplace or? Yeah, so, system marketplace. Yeah, a lot of people talk about it as, um, you know, we're 100% fee-for-service and we're going to go all the way over here on the pendulum. It's going to swing to 100% value-based payment. And I, I don't see it that way. I, I don't think we can do that on a, in any kind of quick process anyway. So we're going to live in all those worlds simultaneously. And I think it's okay that we do that. It makes the revenue model more complicated. An already complicated one gets even even more complicated. But what we have to do, in my opinion, is to look where we have the infrastructure, where you have the complement of physicians, you have the complement of technology, and you have willing participants to begin to pilot those sorts of at-risk arrangements where you can really attack that cost of care, you can keep people healthy, you can do all those things that you need to do. At the same time, you're, if you're going to be a sustainable and thriving organization, you're going to have to work through that whole fee-for-service thing in a, in a responsible way, not in one that's looking to fully exploit it. 
Uh, as an example, uh, it's true that hospitals buy physician offices and then quickly convert freestanding rates to hospital-based rates. We did it. Mer Mercy's guilty of doing that. But we made the decision this past year that we're going to undo that, that uh, the consumer burden is too great, and frankly, they're voting with their feet and they're going elsewhere. So we're going to reverse that. We're going to go back to freestanding rates in lab and imaging and all those sorts of things. That will impact the cost of care. It impacts our revenue. It's about a $40 million hit for us this year as we do that. At the same time, we've got another $40 million hit from sequestration and all these other government program changes. So that's an $80 million reduction. Our bottom line is $125 million. We've, we're having to overcome that through all these other cost savings and operational changes that I'm describing. But we simply have to do it. We have to be a responsible part of the American health care system. And I often tell Mercy leaders that it's our job, our obligation, to have this noble pursuit of curing the American health care system. It is broken in some ways. Now, it's not on that individual patient to doctor level that they experience, but when you look at it at a macro level, it's got to change pretty dramatically. We can wait for somebody to mandate it and tell us what to do, or we can begin to demonstrate that there are better ways and then share that knowledge and learning with others. And that's really how we're approaching it. That's great, Mike, when you're talking, you're talking about chronic disease management, and it's a large portion of the cost structure, 70% um, of cost, roughly, a large portion of the cost. And there's so much emphasis, and particularly, um, we had a lot of discussions about the hospital environment, the acute care environment. But Spectrum's an interesting organization. Um, you're both a provider, but you're also a payer. Mm -hmm. So tell us about this, because this world is changing, where payers are becoming providers and providers are becoming payers. How do you live in both of those worlds? You know, it's not as, as difficult, I think, as people might think. Uh, and one half of our business is insurance. The one half that's delivery, obviously, they come in conflict. But what it takes from a leadership standpoint is sitting down and reminding everybody on the team, whether they're in insurance or whether they're in the medical group, we, we're basically hospital group, medical group, insurance, that's kind of our three pieces, that we all work together, that this is our home, that these are our kids, that those are my parents and your parents, they're your next door neighbors and my next door neighbors. And so first and foremost, you quickly realize that you have to set your benchmark as doing the right thing, because otherwise you're gonna drive yourselves crazy, you can't work together. So you sit there and you go, okay, what's the right thing to be working on? What's the right thing to be doing? And then start working through, well, what's the, the repercussions of that, as Lynn was saying? You know, the difficulty in the hospital business right now, obviously, for our specialists in our medical group and for our hospitals, if, if, if we were to have a, a better emphasis on, on chronic mm -hmm. disease and had more people taken care of at home, which is what we're trying to do, we're not going to have as many patients in the hospital. But you know what, if you give me five years to financially plan my way out of that, I, I know I can do that. I know all the other financial people around the country would say the same thing. Well, so part of what we have to do is make sure that we're always looking down the road. I never work on today. I'm always five years down the road. Mm -hmm. And that's part of my responsibility is to make sure that we're saying, okay, well then get it out piece by piece. And it's doable. It's all very, very doable. I think the struggle with it that I see uh, that we haven't talked much about today is not only is it this chronic disease cost, but I don't know if any of you have seen that the graph that's out there. I think the researchers from, were from Carnegie Mellon. I have used it, I must say. And uh, you know, you compare us against other OECD countries. And we look pretty competitive until we hit, hit age 65. And then all of a sudden it's this hockey stick where we're very, very expensive. I remember the first time I saw it, I said, oh, that can't be right. And then I woke up in the middle of the night and it was a dual eligible issue. I said, oh my God, I forgot the dual eligibles. And so many of our, our elderly population or our under age 65 with mental illness, these are big chronic disease spends. And if we don't de redesign a, a model around them and do something different, it's very hard to imagine that anything that he and I might do in our hospitals to carve away certain amounts of expense to make them more efficient, if you don't get at this bigger part of the spend, then it's almost impossible to change healthcare as a percent of GDP. We'll be talking about 17, 16, 9, 17, 4, not 12 or 13. In my market, we think it's around 13, 7 or so because we are, our healthcare costs tend to, be, uh, tend to be a little bit lower. But so these are the struggles for us in terms of as we look at healthcare costs, it's how are we going to, how are we going to be able to redesign that and focus first and foremost about why we come to work every day let the repercussions of that be our challenge as yeah. we are constantly so looking So, Mike, your hospital administrator been in place for a number of years. Um, years ago, you worried about filling up beds. Right. Now, you know, you probably spend a lot of time on population health mm -hmm. and worry about people 
coming back into the hospital, readmissions. Do you spend a fair amount of time on thinking about now the whole continuum of care, not just the acute care setting? Yeah, we do that. I would say we spend all the time on that. And then what we try to do is help as colleagues. I'll turn to my hospital group colleague when I was the CFO of the system and now as the president of the health plan. And it'll be like, okay, well, if we can create that value proposition, how do we, how do you get the opportunity to win market share if your value proposition is that good? Let's not just automatically assume that we're going to lower the cost of health care and that we go on business as usual. That, that's really not fair to those who put tremendous investment in lowering you know, the cost of health care and getting much better outcomes and a much better patient experience, more integrated, et cetera. And so that's where we've, we've kind of said we've got to figure out how to, uh, to make that better for people. Yeah, so you know, part of the reengineering that's happening in healthcare is around integrating the care. Yeah. And a large trend over the last three to five years has been healthcare systems employing physicians. So I'm going to ask you about your, your approach to this. Um, some people estimate as much as uh, 65, many as 65% of healthcare uh, physicians in the United States now are employed or have some type of employer relationship with healthcare systems. Larger percentage of specialists, smaller percentage of primary care. And the reason for that is to, you know, to get more coordinated care, but getting back to some of the earlier discussion around, reminds you of the Wizard of Oz, are you a good witch or are you a bad witch? Are you a good witch or are you a bad witch? So, Lynn, have you done some of this and why you've done it and, you know, what, what, you know, in the short run, what are you trying to get done with it? In the long term, what are you trying to prove uh, in terms of bending the cost curve? Yeah, so Mercy's absolutely an integrated healthcare delivery model. So we have about 2,000 physicians that are part of Mercy Clinic, integrated, employed, whatever word you prefer to use. Another 800 advanced practitioners, PAs, advanced practice nurses, et cetera, and complement to those physicians. And I would tell you that, and that's across those four states, and not every market happened at the same time. We had one market that really began that journey in 99, and others that didn't start till 2009. But today, we're pretty much at the same level of integration in almost every community. But if the goal was simply to um, corner the market by employing physicians, then I think that'd be a pretty low expectation and a, a poor goal to have. Our goal around it was we really believe healthcare <coughs> delivery is better that way, that when you all work as a team, when you're all pulling together, you can have better outcomes. And the physicians have really taken amazing leadership roles in that today. So if you look at my executive staff, six out of 18 are physicians. And they're not just running clinical space. They're doing business functions and presidents of hospitals and all sorts of things. But they're challenging their peers about care delivery. And I told you about uh, the engineer and the cardiologist and the care paths. And there's lots of other examples where they're really using new tools to reinvent care, but they do it through a pretty interesting structure. They've created specialty councils that span the entire ministry, so cardiology or orthopedics or hospital-based, whatever you want, primary care is a specialty council, and they have appointed leaders within their regions to speak for them, and they come together actually every two weeks, and they are working on a set of projects, whether it's one of those care paths or whether it's some documentation <clears throat> issue that they need to improve, and the culture that has gotten built across the ministry is fascinating because now this doctor in Fort Smith, Arkansas is a colleague of this doctor in St. Louis, Missouri. And when they need consultative help, they're calling across communities and actually using some of the virtual technologies to create these consultations. So it's important, if you're really gonna get the full benefit of employing physicians and you're gonna deliver on a new model of care in your community, you're gonna to have to allow them to be leaders you're going to have to get them in positions and help them, train them. They're not naturally taught in medical school necessarily about how to be leaders, but you, we have you know, pretty extensive phys physician leadership development plans as well. Uh, we talk a lot about being physician-led and professionally managed. It doesn't mean the physician's the leader and there's some other professional person managing. It means together we're at the table making decisions. It's a little... Interesting as a CEO, it's not a classic model. Uh, I don't just say this is where we're going. I have a lot of consultation with the physicians, and once they're bought into it, it's pretty amazing how fast the organization can move in the right direction. Uh, but while, like I said, it's not just about you know acquiring as many physicians as you can gather up in a market. It's really about getting the right cultural fit that they want to be in your organization. And two, if you really want to change things, you're going to have to build a collegial environment where they can lead that transformation. Great. Uh, one last question yeah. for the two of you before we uh, turn it over to questions from the audience. Mike, 
What percentage, five years from now, do you think of your business is going to be risk-based? Well, it's already uh, probably 50%, but uh, you know, I, I would say down the road, for me, uh, probably three quarters, when I look, re think back at what our financial plan is, it'll probably be three quarters of that because we'll insure so much of it. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that will necessarily be the case in the rest of the, you know, the, rest of the industry. But to give you an idea right now, I have 51% of my Medicare eligible population in a Medicare Advantage plan right now. Cool. I never dreamed that that would be the case uh, many, many years ago when Choice first got established and then it got changed to Advantage under the Modernization Act. So, you know, a lot of this is changing very, very rapidly. Um, I would throw out a caution with regard to that because I know that's what everybody's talking about now. Everybody, it's ACOs and it's, uh, you know, some kind of value-based payment. If I spin you back to the 90s, it was PHOs and capitation. We've been in this play before. And I think we have to be very careful right now. I hope the regulators pay very, very close attention because one of the things you, I think we're quick to do sometimes is to jump into something new. But if, you, if you're taking a full risk capitation agreement right now and you don't know the definition of risk-based capital, you should not be doing it. And, be, and, the re, and any of the bankers in the room will know what I'm talking about. We, we run the risk of if everybody, all of a sudden we transfer a bunch of risk to the provider industry and take it away from the insurance industry where there's adequate risk-based capital to insure someone at that moment that they need it, that's a very, very dangerous thing to do. It could, I could draw you a map, I've done it uh, for when I do presentations, of how this looks like the mortgage industry. So I think we have to be very careful because somebody starts offloading risk, well then who's got the equity capital necessary to do that? So I think we all have to be very careful. The bigger organizations certainly, I think we'll see more of it because they can, and I would caution them to really think through how they want to do it if that's the case because uh, you know, I, could, I could easily eat your lunch in underwriting and if you don't know, it doesn't take much to do that. And I think people need to be really partner with organizations who really fit your organization if you're going to go down that particular path and that you feel comfortable that you have the right business arrangements with and the right trust and the right why in terms of what you're That's doing um, that would make you successful. Yeah. Lynn, what would your estimate be yeah, five I, years from now? Yeah, I completely agree space? with Michael. But our situation, we, won't have, we don't have the integrated health plan. So our estimates say 20, 25 percent okay. might be in that yeah. cat. And I'm talking all spectrums sure. of risk, not yeah. just capitated. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of OK, who'd like to stand up and ask us some questions? I guess you're already queued up. Again, and, uh, introduce yourself and uh, question, and we'll do the best we I'm can Mary to answer Coons. all questions you might okay. have. So first one. Okay, I'm Barry Coombs. I teach at UM Law School. Great. This has all been really interesting. People have developed a sense of the complexity of the problems and given us some solutions that seem to work. And there's also been a lot of talk about data management and assessing. So I have a question for each of you. You've told us about things, that ideas you came up with that did work, but you also, we also learn from people's failures. So can you give me an example of something you said, this is a great idea, and then when you went to check was it working? It turned out it didn't work. Yeah, great question. Mm -hmm. uh, so what didn't work? Um, well, I'm going to ask Lynn and Mike to talk about their examples of the electronic medical record. <laughs> so I've been at this for some time. Uh, I've been in med tech and healthcare for about 30 years. And some portion of my career, I worked for Hewlett Packard's medical business. I, I was the last one to lead it before I sold it to Philips. And, and part of that, I ran the software business, and we're really pioneers in electronic medical records. Well, this is back in the 80s, mid-80s, and we said in 10 years, you know, the whole healthcare system in the United States is going to be on a computer system, and we're going to get rid of all the paper. Well, that was the mid-80s. Well, here we are. Um, it's 2014, and we have a, a fraction of the healthcare system running electronically, and we've got more work to do. So that's a good example. It, it's, it's very, very hard um, to streamline uh, a process that's very complex. Because it's not just about the information system. It's about streamlining the care processes. And only mm. then can you then automate it with an information system. So these two gentlemen, I know, have put in electronic medical records. Mike, why don't we start with you? I hear you have two. You have an Epic system, a Cerner system. Can you talk a little bit about sure. the information um, systems? I'll give you a couple of real quick examples, because I know there's a lot of questions out there. So we, yes, we do. We have Cerner in our hospital, Epic in our medical group, for obvious reasons. They kind of you know, morphed over the course of the years. We didn't have a medical group 10 or 15 years ago. But I think the, the couple things to keep in mind. So I was at a value stream analysis of my ICU last week, sitting with the physician who runs it. We had 
with all of the infrastructure that I have in electronic medical records, the mobile platforms, et cetera, we had three CBCs ordered by three different physicians in one day on an ICU patient. Now, it's a little complicated. We can laugh at it. It's not a ton of expense, but I think it's a symptom of a bigger problem. If individually we still don't figure out how to way to make physicians comfortable practicing with each other in these environments, and we don't have a closed ICU for those of you who know what that means, although I think that's where we're heading, we've got to find a way to do something different because I can put all the tools out there, but in the end it comes down to some communication. That was a, a learning experience for us in terms of uh, this, this isn't over. We're going to have to fi figure out a way to make sure that we do that differently mm -hmm. in the future. So that's been one of the problems that we've had with the electronic medical record. Second one I'll say relates primarily to the health plan, but really I think applies everywhere. If I had to do it all over again, I'd emphasize mobile first before everything else. So in other words, we we've been devising a lot of solutions in our health plan to give people the ability to manage their relationships with their physician, to check on their results, to be able to email and, do it, and to check on price right there when they have the child in their hand and they're at the physician office and how much is this going to cost me out of pocket. I developed it on the Windows platform first before I did it on the mobile platform. So I think, uh, again, staying up with technology and saying maybe we need to jump ahead and develop it there, some of these things there first, to put them, again, right at the hands of the clinicians or the people when they're using them at that moment, rather than saying, hey, this is something you can look at after the fact. It's just not as relevant after the fact. Oh, yeah, thanks, Mike. Let's go to the right-hand side here. Hi, uh, yes, uh, Plato Alexander. I'm here uh, pursuing my MBA at the University of Miami. I'm also a uh, practicing pediatric cardiac intensivist, and I also have a degree in engineering. So great. Great. Yay, great. For, the, for the gentleman from you have all uh, the RC. tools, all the tools. <laughs> Can you come to Grand Rapids? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll give you my card. <laughs> I have my CV, so let's talk. <laughs> I, I hope my CEO isn't here. Um, I'm curious about transparency. Very interesting, that notion. I'm also wondering about quality of care indices. So things like uh, length of stay, um, bloodstream infections, um, mm -hmm. those sorts of notions that you should be able to get when you, for example, look at a consumer reports. Are you interested in making that public? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. so uh, let me start. I'm going to turn it to Lynn. Um, so I'm in the laboratory business. Um, you know, there's thousands of laboratories. Uh, the pricing of laboratory work is wide-ranging. <clears throat> Matter of fact, uh, two weeks ago, ABC News did a story, did an expose on the differences in laboratory fees. And going back to an earlier discussion, it gets back to the consumer getting engaged because the consumer is now asking questions. Um, and you, you, this actually uh, exposed a, a situation where they went through our facility, we did the work, and then went around the corner and did the work. And the out-of-pocket cost was seven times more expensive. And, and what health systems are doing, and well, integrated delivery systems and health insurance companies are doing, is making this aware to their membership. And also, there's new businesses being formed to get all that information in the hand of consumers. And in this day and age, with high deductible plans and a large percentage of our health care costs paid by the individual, the consumer is now getting more engaged. But to Mike's earlier point, the consumer has to be engaged. And they're not used to it, but they're getting started. So Lynn, what's your experience on this? So you can already get that information on the CMS website, healthcarecompare.gov or whatever it is, uh, for hospitals. You're about to be able to get it for physicians, too. And one of the rallying cries we have with our doctors today is, is a, probably one of the biggest projects we're working on right now around clinical documentation and precision around that. And what I often say to them, one word left out can destroy their reputation as a physician. They don't even realize some of them they're being measured already in that process. And so we have a lot of examples how you've done great work, but you're not going to get credit for it if you don't document correctly. And we're working really hard to get the right, because now our reputations are tied together and it's transparent. If a patient wants to go see their doctor in their hospital and how they're performing, at least on Medicare patients, they can see it. But it's our intent to make that very transparent on our website and begin to reveal those sorts of things and just celebrate it and get away from all this. One of the things that healthcare providers do that drives me crazy is all this chest beating advertising. We're the best at this, we're the best at that. The US News and World Report, this, that, and the other. Consumers just tune that out. I can't begin to explain how, in all of our marketing testing, they don't get, but when they are about to have something done, and if they're of that mindset that they're a kind of comparative shopper, they will go research for that. So transparency is going to be key 
it, and they're going to vote, and Medicare folks can vote with their feet, right, and go wherever they want. And more and more markets where narrow networks are starting to form, it's interesting. People aren't as exactly happy about that. They may like the price difference a little bit, but they're not real happy about the restriction on care. So I think that transparency thing will be a differentiator. If you can show how you're really doing and you can have good results, then I think people will vote with their feet and pick you. Excellent. Next question, please. Yes. My name is Mark Alexander. I'm National Director of Medical Office Sales for Sperry Van Ness based in Irvine, California. Um, my question is for uh, Steve Ruskowski. Um, in this environment of re-engineering healthcare and tying in with um, Mike's comment about leadership to do the, do the right thing first for patients and tying in with Lynn's comments on how Mercy got the community involved to provide input in designing and their a new acute care center um, because it's better for patients is Quest um, in changing or shifting its target for future locations to become more retailization uh, because I, being a medical office broker specialist, I know Quest is in many small traditional medical office buildings around the country. And as those leases expire, are right. y'all looking to jump on the bandwagon with this retailization of sure. healthcare, reaching out to patients where they live, where they work, right. in a more retail environment? Right. Well, great question. And, and the answer to your question is yes. We're, enga we're engaged in that as Quest. Um, if you need a broker, just kidding. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, just to give you an uh, understanding, uh, you know, we have, where we draw the specimens. So where we draw the blood, uh, take the specimens. We have about 2,000, we call them retail outlets throughout the United States. Uh, interesting enough, if you look through you know, where we get the specimens, we only do about 17% of that draw work. Another 17%, we actually have our phlebotomists in the office of physicians. So actually we do that work there. Um, but you're also asking an interesting question, is just what's happening with the retail nature of healthcare? And it gets back to the redesign of who does what work. And so we're engaged with many of these, uh, many of the retail uh, pharmacy chains that are looking at the different environments. Um, I know Walgreens was here. Uh, they're doing uh, some health clinics in their facilities. Uh, CVS as the Minute Clinic. Um, you know, some of the large retails or retailers are getting in the healthcare business. And, and, and if you're in the healthcare business where people go, you need to have, have all the different healthcare services. So we're exploring all that. And we're trying to be as user and as consumer friendly in that regard, because it goes back again to what I said at the beginning. Healthcare has to do more with less, uh, but that doesn't mean less quality. It has to be better. And so we're thinking about it more from a consumer mindset, and that's part of a brand promise, if you will. So we're thinking about more from a brand positioning perspective. So over here. Uh, hi, my name is Christopher D. I'm uh, receiving my medical degree in MPH from the medical school and uh, finishing my last year of orthopedic surgery residency at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. Uh, my question for the panel is uh, that if variability in usage drives a lot of our excessive cost, and there's a lot of variability in device usage, a uh, study in health affairs, uh, the most recent issue, showed that at least orthopedic surgeons and likely many physicians aren't really aware of the costs of the devices that they're using. How have your organizations attempted to address the variability in, uh, in device utilization, and, uh, and have you met any resistance uh, from your clinicians, and how have you uh, handled that? Yeah, that's an excellent question, and uh, you hit specifically on orthopedics, not to pick on orthopedics, and I think you mentioned Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. and. I uh, know that organization well, and I'm going to give a little bit of value, a little bit of background. Um, goes back to the employer comments. Uh, General Electric has done a lot of work on re-engineering their cost structure, and um, actually, I was visiting the hospital for special surgery in New York, and they have formed a contract with General Electric, and um, all hips for GE go to hospital for special surgery, um, and it's all around cost, and. Let me ask Mike, have you done any direct contracting with employers and how do you get physicians that use these expensive devices like orthopedic devices to think about costs if yeah. you're really bundling payments, no longer all the different processes, but we're going to get for $10,000, do your hip. A couple of things. Number one, we don't do direct contracting with them, obviously, because we're an insurer. So we have self-funded employers. We insure Medicaid, Medicare. We have you know, kind of all parts of the... Um, all parts of the business in that regard. I would say that we've done value stream mapping on it with our physicians. 
And so we, we were able to get a more standardized, not completely, because obviously you and your colleagues, there's, there's differences in terms of what people feel comfortable with. But we certainly have pointed out all those differences and had them very engaged in the process of what they could do. And they made significant changes. Um, it was amazing to me what the cost of one little screw is. Just the security of that screw, that's like, you know, from a banking standpoint, that's more valuable than money. So you, you realize some of these things as you go through it. But the one thing I would say to you is, in my opinion, I know you hear those kind of studies. What we've said to our physicians has been, we just want them to get the very best outcomes at the very best price that they possibly can. I don't really see orthopedics like that. I don't see that as being a driver of our problem today. I, don't wanna, I hope we're not going to look at a future where we can't get hip and knee replacements as we age. And I would say that when I look at the actual costs, and I lay that out in the big premium, and I start looking at chronic disease as opposed to you know 58-year-olds or 6-year-olds getting uh, hips and knees, I would probably still continue to do what we're doing with, you know, with the value stream analysis and, and re-engineering that, and at the same time, not lose our focus on, um, on chronic disease. Great. Next question. Hi, I'm Alex Koziak. I'm a current undergrad here at the U. I'm studying health sector management and policy as well as economics. We've been talking a lot about reforming the way the healthcare system is being delivered, especially to low income areas. What potential do you think there exists for mobile healthcare and I mean mobile healthcare clinics to be able to provide access to these low income areas? Mike, you want, uh, Lynn, you want to talk yeah, through absolutely. what you're so, doing? Uh, we, um, we do that in a number of, in almost all of our markets in one way or the other. Perhaps the best example is in Laredo, Texas, where we sold our acute care operation, but we remained in the community to provide primary care to those who otherwise wouldn't have access to it. And we have a number of mobile vans that literally bring the clinic into different parts of the community. And it is their primary way of receiving health care today. So there's lots of ways to it. But you don't have to just focus it, frankly, on, the, on those who can't pay or are underserved in some way. There are lots of convenience things that we do today with mobile clinics and care in some of the rural but communities with populations who can pay, and it's just, it's a question of access. And then there's a whole play for telemedicine with that that's just incredible. And so, for example, we do telepsychology today into the whole southwest Missouri area, and we did a study just to see how much the patients liked it. And the families drove 55,000 less miles to get their kids to their psychology appointment because they did it in their local community through telemedicine, and they cut out, I forget how many thousands of walk, lost work days. So it helped the family and it got the care that they needed, but they were still able, they were still paying for it. But it's just all kinds of convenience and other ways to deliver. Care. I think it's a great question. I would say redefine the mobile as the mobile you know more today, yeah. because that's what we're seeing. In other words, we, we've got people, when we do studies on it, 75, 80% of our members would say they, they like group visits. They like e-visits. They're willing to do those. And of course, for a lot of people who are poor and struggle with bus lines, et cetera, that can be a legitimate option, particularly if they need a prescription or something like that. Mm -hmm. That is changing so rapidly right now. In some parts of the country, you know, Kaiser, they've been doing this kind of stuff forever. The rest of us haven't. So you're going to see that kind of disparity. But it's changing very, very quickly. And I think the brick and mortar approach that we all kind of grew up with in my generation of building these clinics, I think, is, is changing very, very rapidly right now. I think that goes back to my comment. You've got to be simultaneously local, regional, and virtual if you're going to be successful and progressive in healthcare. Just yeah. trying to get through all the questions yeah. before we break. So question over here. Good morning. My name is Francesco Parra. I'm Hi, a geriatric and addiction psychiatrist. In Puerto Rico, we have a company. We service over 700 lives per week, probably. And uh, we wanted to, I wanted to find out what strategies have you used um, in dealing with uh, chronic disease such as depression and uh, anxiety, falls, and noncompliance that have worked for you, and where do you see yourself in the near future? What direction are you taking in order to improve that? Mike, you want to take that one? Yes. Uh, great question. Uh, I'm going to answer it both personally and professionally. The chronic disease, as it pertains to, let's say, depression, as you, as you know, this affects usually other people's lives. They've got multiple chronic diseases going on at the, same, uh, at the same time. We want very badly because I said, why do we do what we do? We want to take care of our community. So for us, that means everybody. And that includes a lot of this dual eligible population. Not the over age 65 that we're referring to, but the under age 65, which are people who have mental illness and, and then might be 58 years old. I've got a brother who's one of them. You know, I can't find him today. And it's mental illness. 
and it's psychotic behavior. And those are the kind of things that everyone says, well, let's do a population health approach to that. Well, yeah, we can. It's, they spend an awful lot of money. We know that. But as you know, well, no, doctor, it's very, very hard to keep track of those people. You know, they're not necessarily going to stay in one community and, and do whatever it is that you want them to do and be very compliant patients. And so I think what we're trying to do is, first and foremost, if we can identify them and put a population, that's why I think the, the care of the dual eligibles in particular is so important. We've got to try. And that's where it starts. We've got to be willing to take that kind of risk. And in my community, 10,000 people like that would be a half a billion dollars of medical spend. It's an awful lot of money. And what we're trying to do is say, how do we find ways to care for them, engage with them using a lot of community-based organizations? Because I don't have all of that expertise in my company. How do we make sure that we can partner with the organizations who can build the trust with these people, who could keep in contact with them? And then likewise, how do we enable that with better technology? Because as I said, on any given day, they may be homeless. And, and th when that happens, you don't necessarily, you can't just say, hey, you missed your appointment today because you can't find them. OK, next question. Thank you. My name is Ray Francois. I'm a nursing education hey, major, uh, graduate. And my question to the panel has to do with education naturally. Um, with all the new technology and the new tools that are out there, what is the, what is the healthcare providers doing to educate the population served and the community about these tools and how to manage them and actually be engaged and use them? Great question, uh, education. Well, I, it's been touched on in the course of this morning that uh, we're going to need a lot of healthcare workers. Um, at Quest, we employ about 42,000 people. And in some of our locations, we have a tough time finding people that can do what we need to do. So it's uh, something that we spend some time on. And so we're engaging with local universities. We're engaging with um, uh, specialty uh, um, groups that can help us improve the capabilities of training and education to be able to deliver on that. Uh, but let me ask Lynn what you've yeah. done in so your locations to get the people you need. Yeah, is the question about how to educate the professionals in no, the new, or, doing, the or the patients? I no, would, we're doing a great job this morning as far as educating the professionals. professionals yeah. But we're talking about educating the people who are out there uh, using the tools, when you have um, an electric MAR, EMAR, and you come into a patient's room and you're scanning their name ban band, how do you, what are you guys doing to make sure that they understand what that is? When you say you have um, being able to access your EMAR on your iPhone, are you, mm -hmm. the, what are we doing to educate the population? What does that mean? How can I use that? How do I get them engaged? Sure. Like he mentioned earlier, a lot of uh, they did um, allow access to looking at prices, and but there were people that were not using it. They were not engaged. Yeah. How are we as healthcare providers um, educating yeah. the overall population that will be using these right. services? So I mentioned that we had 400,000 people that accessed their record online at Mercy, right. and they had different. So some it was intuitive. It was that well designed that they if they're a savvy phone user they can do it others they weren't if right. they maybe weren't familiar with it so we had we do have in the physician practices ways that we can deliver education in the clinic uh -huh. or we have online tools that we actually allow the patient to use to learn how to access and and we have people staff who call and say did you know you could do this and here's how you do it this new feature is coming yeah. and we use an online panel we have 40,000 people that have signed up to interact with us on surveys, and we get great response rates, like 70%, but we let them tell us, is this gonna be intuitive to use, mm -hmm. or should we redesign it? So the goal is to really make it so easy that there's not just a lot of education that has to happen, but when it does, we do have resources at yeah. different levels to help them. That's great, Lynn, and thank you very much, and that'll be a great way to close. Um, you know, the best way to allow people to do what they need to do is to make it really easy. In this iPhone, I have my phone. I didn't get training on it, but somehow I learned how to use it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the device manufacturers and information systems companies are just trying to make things so obvious and so intuitive with their user interfaces they could, they could um, anyone could do it. Anyone could figure it out. So I'd like to thank our panelists. Thank you. Lynn, thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'd like, like, I like to thank the audience, and now it's time for lunch.